Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar on Malaysia's flood warning system called Red Light Means Go, the role of inoperative warning system in Malaysia's flood disaster. Um, good morning to our speakers and attendees. My name is Ileana Hasha, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Um, before we start, I will let Karina, the director for UCLWRC, to give us some introduction to our organization. Thank you. Great, good morning everyone and good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are from the world. Uh, welcome, we are delighted to have you here uh, today. Um, I am just trying to share my slides that are hopefully coming up here now. So um, just wanted to say a huge welcome to you all um, and, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to have a really fantastic um, talk. Um, Momo will, will be our wonderful host, um, sorry, Ileana will be our wonderful host um, today. And, um, and uh, I wanted to just take this opportunity to welcome you and give a little bit of an overview about the UCL Warning Research Centre in case uh, you guys are not aware of it. So just a very brief uh, introduction. So I'm Karina Fernley. I'm an Associate Professor at um, the Department of Science and Technology Studies at UCL. And I am also Director and Founder of the Warning Research Centre. And we set up this research warning centre because we wanted to um, have a dedicated centre looking at both natural and human made hazards um, and um, in terms of the context of warnings. Um, and so we are really the the first dedicated research centre that tries to bring together uh, not just different hazards, but also different stakeholders across a wide, wide range of disciplines, geographies, uh, and social and livelihood contexts. So what we're trying to do is understand how different warnings work for different hazards and threats and see if we can share good ideas and practices and um, lessons learned, uh, lessons identified, um, and, and see if we can help enhance warning systems going Going forward. Uh, so we want to cut across a huge range of vulnerabilities, hazards and threats that's in a way that's not been done before. And of course, we need to focus on the issue of multiple hazards as well, which is something that we're, of course, facing quite a lot with the issues around uh, the climate crisis uh, and so on. So we're wanting to really kind of rethink the way the way warnings are done. And to do that, we have a wonderful uh, set of folk who work for us. We've got 27 core members that are from University College London itself. And then we have 28 affiliates from all around the world who are warning specialists. And really our aim as a centre is to create a hub, a centre of excellence, but a, a sort of a hub communication uh, forum for warnings, for people to come to, to share information, to find contacts and to collaborate and work together. So it's really about creating that community for academic researchers, for practitioners, for policy makers and so on, to, to help find solutions to the very real and complex problems that we're facing. We also want to help provide research expertise to those that need it, provide teaching excellence around warnings, provide policy guidance and do some work around public engagement to raise the awareness of warnings. And in line with the Sendai framework and various other frameworks that are like the Sustainable Development Goals, we are keen to help um, enhance the, the role of warnings and, and make sure that they're uh, being supported within uh, global and international policies. So we've been going for a couple of years now um, and we are um, doing a number of different uh, events. So we're doing our webinar series of which this is one of them. Uh, we are part of the Anticipation Hub. We've recently produced a, a report on enhancing warnings, which was published by the UK National Preparedness Commission. We're working with a number of NGOs um, providing training courses and have um, given a number of media and uh, conference presentations. So we've been pretty busy so far and we're very much looking forward to, 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 to our, our future and engaging with some of you going forward. If you wish to learn more about the centre, you can find our website here and some social media um, uh, uh, sources where you can find more about us and our events and what we're up to. So we've got a full programme coming up for the next year, so please do keep in touch. So today is all about warnings in Malaysia, and we're so thrilled to have such a wonderful panel today um, to talk about warnings in Malaysia. 
Um, you know, as we know, uh, Malaysia has gone through a very uh, steep learning curve in recent years in terms of warning systems. And of course, uh, I've just got some bullet points here where, of course, in 16th of December 2020, we saw some devastating flooding from a, a tropical depression, which uh, impacted a number of different people and was one of the most, well, I think it was, I believe it was the second most deadliest disaster in Malaysia in, 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 in recent history. And so it's interesting that there's been this new siren system that's been put in place and we're going to be hearing more about that today. Um, but as one of our speakers, uh, Dr. Khalmizel uh, Samsudin has said, um, there is room for improvement. And of course, that's the case with all warning systems. So uh, I think one of the things that we'll be looking at today is very much the role of technical warning systems and how we can integrate that into society. So I think we're going to have a really interesting um, discussion. Um, and of course, you know, there's already been reflections already um, by the Malaysian government on how warnings can be done better with the second phase of the warning system already being uh, rolled out to be completed in 2023 to provide better preparedness, which is, which is wonderful. So thank you for joining us. I'm looking forward to hearing from our speakers and learning very, a, a lot more about warnings in Malaysia. Um, and please do introduce yourself in the chat. Feel free to ask questions in the Q&A and I will pass you back to Momo now. All right, thank you, Karina. Um, I'll share my screen first. Okay, can you see it? <laughs> yes. All right. Um, all right. So um, again, thank you to our attendees and our speakers. So we have a variable, we have three panelists today um, coming from UPM, USM, and Isan Johor, ranging from um, academicians and to the people on to the people working on street uh, NGOs itself. Um, let me start first. So Malaysia has a long history with flooding. The first recorded big flood was in 1926, and about 50 years later, in 1971, there was a big flood in Kuala Lumpur, which prompted the um, the introduction of a warning system and. Malaysia has undergone a lot of development from pre and post colonization and also the import and export industrialization age. So with big changes and development, of course, there's um, a lot of hiccups and a lot of things that we can change, right? All right, so geographically speaking, uh, Malaysia is very lucky. So on the east side, it's very exposed to the South China Sea and there's no natural barriers that's protecting them from any types of typhoons um, and whatnot. Um, the west side, have, however, is protected by the island of Sumatra and also the Titiwangsa range. So the Titiwangsa range, it comes from the northernmost part and the foothills um, extends until the southernmost part. Um, however, this has been proven to not be um, as good of a barrier in recent years, especially because of recent developments. Okay, next. Uh, talking about this, in December 2021, there was a big flood that we call a 100-year-old flood that bring about a loss of 1 billion pounds, um, 71,000 people displaced at its peak, and it brought also 54 deaths. So obviously it was a big um, problem and affected so many people. And with that, I will do an overview of the flood warning system in Malaysia. So there's four um, flood warning and warning transformation that has been set up by the government. So they wanted to improve on the early flood forecast duration. And basically these four steps were set up in 2014 after the flooding in um, all over Malaysia. And they set up this forecast and warning system that's expected to be completed in 2025. So with that, they wanted to make an early flood forecast duration. So meaning from one day, we can extend it up to seven days, early flood warning duration and enhancing the flood warning database system, um, increasing all of the flood mitigation and having a wider coverage of flood warning dissemination. 
Next, there is a flood directive that done by the National Disaster Management Agency. They focus a lot on the preparation part and also so we can prepare ourselves before the actual flooding happens or the disaster happens. And there's also has been a lot of talk in terms of capacity building and building community resilience, because even if there is a very good warning system applied, sometimes the people don't know how to apply it to themselves when it does happen. So there's been a lot of discussions between um, the government and the communities itself on how to do capacity building. Next. Okay, so there is some type of warning system done in Malaysia, mainly in short messaging system, telephone, fax, and website. And this warning system will be further explained by one of our panelists, Dr. Haliza Abdurrahman. Um, it's the warning system can, a warning system can always be improved. And with the rise of technology, there's no reason for us to resort to old or archaic type of warning system. And we always want to find a place where we can improve the warning system. Nike. So the questions that I would like to give, I would like to put forward in this webinar and discussion today is how effective are the warning system in Malaysia and how can we learn from other countries? Is it universally accessible by all walks of life? So the most vulnerable groups like children and elders and also disabled people, do they know how to utilize it? Does the people that know how to utilize it will be able, will they be able to help them? And lastly, does the people know what to do after the warning itself? Because the warning itself is not enough. They they need to know what can be done for from them. Okay. And lastly, I would like to introduce the speakers for today. First, we have Dr. Haliza Abdurrahman. So Dr. Haliza Abdurrahman holds a PhD and she is an associate professor from University of Putra Malaysia and her area of expertise include environmental governance, environmental management, and a lot of environmental related issues. Um, her talk will be about, does the warning system really help towards a flight disaster? And then next, we will have Dr. Karim Mita Samsudin, uh, who is the program chairman for School of Health Sciences in University Science Malaysia. He's also um, very, he's basically a flight disaster management specialist and very excited to hear from him. And his talk will be about the government and community strategy to utilize Malaysia's warning system for flight mitigation. And last but certainly not least, we would have Ms. Farah Farida Baptist. So, uh, Ms. Farah Farida Baptist is the CEO for Isan Johor. Isan Johor has been very active in terms of managing and coordinating operation from uh, giving food banks and um, as as soon um, as recently as last year, they help about they help the victims of the flooding in Johor with the food and diapers and basically flood relief. So it'll be very interesting to see how exactly um, the people that does the work on site um, can give their perspective on this. So Ms. Farah will talk about the flood aid in Malaysia by Essen Johor Relief. And with that, um, I let Dr. Haliza start um, with her talk. Thank you. Okay, now I will share my screen. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning and also good afternoon for our uh, participant. We can follow eh, this uh, kind of forum. This is a very good topic eh, because uh, Malaysia is hit uh, frequently by uh, the we can call the traditional disaster which is flood so we need uh, to make sure that our early warning system is really effective in order to make sure that we can minimize the negative impact of that disaster eh? for example to minimize the the loss of the uh, things, eh? uh, uh, that and so on and so forth so uh, I will focus on the early warning system in Malaysia for the flood disaster, is it uh, really um, needs or functioning in order to minimize the disaster? 
Okay. As we know, eh, uh, uh, in worldwide, globally, uh, the disaster is uh, increasing eh, around the globe because uh, uh, the impact of the climate change and also the uh, global warming. So in Malaysia, uh, we have a few types of disaster. Eh. One of the main one is the flood. So that's why we focus on the early warning system. So uh, worldwide, we can also yeah, uh, saw that uh, over the period from uh, 1900 to 2007, flood have claimed yeah, the life million people across all continents and cost 35 billion US in damages. So this is very uh, important disaster which we need to focus to minimize all the impact. Okay. So in Malaysia, excessive rainfall in conjunction with deforestation changes in agriculture practices has led to excessive flooding in part of the country over a few past decades, especially in a um, coastal agriculture region. So uh, increasingly heavy and unpredictable monsoon season uh, season from the northeast, uh, northeast and southeast that occur every year. Eh? This is the main uh, factor why Malaysia hit by the uh, flood every year. So um, the uh, the warning system, eh, as we focus in this uh, forum, is uh, actually eh, an additive warning system measure um, to. Uh, uh, using integrated communication system, which can help community eh, to face the hazardous disaster re related event eh, because hit by uh, some type of disaster, which is uh, the flood. Lah. So it can be implemented as a chain of information communicable system, eh, comprise the sensor, eh, as uh, mentioned by Ileana, eh, even detection and decision subsystem and eh, so on and so forth. Yeah. So increasing the ability of multi-hazard early warning system eh, is also encouraged by the one of the seven, uh, seven global targets by the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction eh, 2015 till to 2030. So, and also we can see, uh, see here, yeah, UNESCO also promotes scientific exchange and collaboration effort in order to establish the effective early warning system, which can focus on hazard. So this is very um, common one, yeah? so we can skip. So uh, what is the early warning system? Actually, the early warning system is the set of capacity needed yeah, to make sure that uh, the uh, information, yeah, all the important information, yeah, the, com uh, the, the uh, complete yeah, uh, information regarding the uh, disaster yeah, can reach to the public, uh, timely and meaningful warning information to enable them yeah, to prepare in order to make sure that they are really um, can uh, confront or face the uh, flood and minimize the impact. Okay, this one we can because we I also I only have ten minutes, eh, so I skip this one. So um, early warning system help community to adapt eh, to various type of disaster. Eh. And early warning system and timely response play a major role in reducing the vulnerability and mortality caused by the disaster. So to be effective, early warning system need to be actively involved the public and also the community because the public will uh, face that type of uh, disaster. So the uh, uh, the public need to be, to make sure that that they, uh, that they are self eh, are really um, uh, enriched with all the preparation eh, uh, uh, for example the the uh, instrument eh, uh, the uh, types of action uh, they can be taken eh, in order to face uh, that type of um, disaster so public need to be educated to make sure they are really um, can um, maximize eh, the early warning system in order uh, to make sure that uh, this is a uh, very uh, or really instrument in helping them. So this is uh, one type of uh, early warning system. Eh? So we can see here, 
this is a uh, physical world of environment. So we have sensor detection, then we can make a decision uh, and then uh, broker respond and this cycle is continuous. Okay, this is also a eh, disaster risk man management cycle eh, which uh, early warning system can be uh, applied in here. So uh, this is uh, one type of uh, prevention. Eh? The early warning system is one type of prevention eh, uh, to minimize the risk. So uh, to, back, to make sure that early warning system is really effective, that system must be uh, a few um, factors eh, uh, need to be focused. The first one is the analysis of the early warning system and then monitoring and warning dissemination and also the communication okay so in Asia as mentioned by Ileana uh, flood is the main uh, disaster in our country yeah we can see from uh, as early uh, as 1920 uh, Malaysia or Mal uh, Malaya eh, uh, uh, in that time eh, hit by uh, a series of flood eh. So actually, yeah, we have two type of um, uh, flood. First one is the seasonal flood. Every year we hit by that type of flood, eh? especially in the East Coast uh, state, for example, in Kelantan, in Terengganu. Eh? So another one is the flash flood. The flash flood is mostly eh, uh, contribute by the human factor, which they um, fail or uh, fail to practice the sustainable development. Eh? As example, they um, uh, do some kind of deforestation, eh? um, uh, fail to manage the drainage system uh, very well. This is a, a factor that make the uh, flash flood is uh, dominant eh? sometimes uh, instead of the seasonal flood. So in here, eh, we have experienced major flood eh, since 1920. Uh, we can see here eh, the current one is in, in uh, 2021, which the flood hit the Klang Valley, especially uh, the state of Selangor. So uh, why we focus to early warning system? Eh? For example, eh, the, the losses, eh, um, be, uh, because of the flood is very, uh, very high. Eh? For example, in 2014, Malaysia was uh, hit by the heavy rain eh? and the river is well. And in that time, eh, uh, around 500,000 to 1 million people, eh, especially living in Kelantan and Terengganu, were affected. Yeah? That's why the early warning system is very important. And this major flooding was recorded as a national disaster. Every time uh, the flood hit, we uh, can categorize uh, the, the, the flood as a national disaster because the impact is very high. So, uh, and also uh, explained by Farah, eh, in our country, uh, the Majlis Keselamatan Negara is the body, the main body to plan, coordinate, and delegate the flood mitigation task to the uh, public and so on and so forth. So uh, actually in Malaysia, uh, we have an early warning system. Uh, we have 15, uh, more than 50 early warning system eh, in, uh, which is already in our main uh, river, eh, main um, uh, river in our country to make sure that we can detect if, uh, if the uh, level of water in our river is uh, past the standard eh? but um, in here eh, uh, we can discuss why when uh, flood hit the Klang Valley eh, in 2021 the early warning early warning system is um, we can call a fail eh, to give uh, early information to the public because in our country most of the flood is seasonal flood especially in its east coast eh, which, uh, which I mentioned uh, previously but when we have a um, main flood eh, hit the Klang Valley, uh, the, the public, the agencies are not really uh, prepared because um, in our mind, the flood is always seasonal and also hit yeah, annually uh, at the some state, as, uh, as I mentioned, yeah, the East Coast and also some part of the southern um, state 
such as Johor. Eh? But in Klang Valley, most of the flood is dominated by the flash flood. That's why when the, uh, the flood hit the Klang Valley, the early warning system is not so ready, the agency is not so ready also, uh, the public also not as well prepared. That's why eh, the, the early warning system in Klang Valley uh, need to be uh, revised. Lah. Yeah. So when uh, the public already faced the uh, fresh, uh, the flood, eh, the big flood, uh, such as in 2021, so they have already ha uh, have experience on that. So maybe in future when the same flood hitting eh, again, or hit again, maybe they already have experience how to face yeah, this kind of flood. And also, eh, um, actually, eh, our uh, main agency eh, in uh, forecast uh, uh, the the uh, apa tu? Uh, the forecast uh, for the disaster, eh, the meteor meteor meteorological department already uh, released the warning eh, that uh, two days before the the flood, uh, the, the the department eh, already. Um, release the warning that um, maybe some part of Klang Valley will be hit by the heavy rain. But um, this is only a warning, but the, the another agency, the public is not surely uh, regarding the uh, warning and they are not well prepared. So uh, because of that, our prime minister eh, um, call eh, to improve the communication system for flood warning to ensure that information is channeled more effectively and also comprehensively. And uh, the early warning system should not be restricted to SMS text only, but also include the videos and also the real-time information eh, so that Malaysia could be more aware of the real flood situation. So why uh, actually uh, the early warning system is very effective in order to minimize the impact of the flood because uh, when we have the eff effective uh, or efficient early warning system, uh, the, uh, the system uh, possibly uh, can use the data from weather and also hydrometeorological uh, station. Uh, and then uh, we can focus on automatic evaluation, notification of the responsible person at the first sign, immediate warning and notification activation, direct connection to the direct connection of sensor to siren, large area coverage, total independent, and also uh, so many um, function of the early warning system. So uh, after we are hit by the 2021 uh, flood in Klang Valley, eh, because, because in Malaysia, Klang Valley is very important eh, because all the economics, eh, uh, the, the main economics are in uh, Klang Valley eh, because uh, most of our uh, industrial eh, uh, port uh, um, and also other activities are focused on Klang Valley. Eh. So for the future, the National Flight Forecasting and Warning System, eh, PRABN Warning System, will be fully operational in 2022 because of that uh, experience from the 2021 uh, 20, uh, flight. So the system gives a warning by sounding a siren as, as early as two days before flood occur, in addition to forecasting flood seven days before uh, it happened. In the meantime, a total of 120 closed, eh, closed uh, circuit television, CCTV, camera, will be placed in river to monitor the water level monitoring system in the river basin. So in 2023, uh, they will be uh, uh, broad, eh, huge. It will be evolved river basin in Sungai Kelang, Sungai Langat, eh, and also to other states, yeah? especially uh, northern state including the Penang and also Kedah. So we hope eh, with the um, effective um, early warning system, eh, with a wide covering of early one system, the, the flood eh, um, can be uh, detected as early as possible and also the, the public can be uh, prepared early and also the, uh, the impact can be minimized. That's all, Farah. Uh, that's all, uh, Eliana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Haliza. Uh, I already have so many questions, uh, but I'll save that for the Q&A session. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Karim Wiza Samsudin. Thank you, Dewi.
Thank you. Give me a moment. Okay, thank you very much, Juliana uh, and Karina as well. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, my name is Karim Mizar Samsudin uh, from USM. Uh, I would like to share on government and community strategy to utilize Malaysia warning system for flood mitigations. Before that. Okay, all right. I, I just heard double voice just now, so uh, I need to manage my uh, technicals. Okay, all right. So <clears throat> when we talk about government and community strategy to utilize Malaysia warning system for flood mitigations, um, in Malaysia, uh, because Dr. Haliza sharing, uh, share some uh, interesting information also just now, I'd just like to share some um understanding or some jokes sometimes that we have in Malaysia, uh, compared to other countries in the world that have winter, spring, summer, autumn season, Malaysia also has four seasons. And for your information, our season is not like the winter, spring, summer, or autumn season, but we are monsoon season, flat season, and then after that, dengue season, and the, my favorite, the fruit season or the durian season itself. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> that's just uh, some of the jokes that we always have. Uh, in Malaysia, we also have four seasons. Okay, let's go to the real part. And when we talk about uh, <clears throat> early warning system, my expertise is more on management of crisis and emergency. Hence, my views um, will concentrate towards early warning system and uh, issues in managing disaster during the early warning system itself. So let's start. So I would like to concentrate uh, into, uh, make this into a case study, and I would like to focus into four elements of community-based early warning system. So when we talk about community-based early warning system, we have uh, to understand the risk knowledge, we have to have monitoring and warning services, we have dissemination and communication, and we have a response capability. And to top this up, I would like to use the Taman Sri Moda disaster that, uh, Eliana have been sharing and uh, uh, been sharing by my colleague in EPM as well, Dr. Aliza, <coughs> uh, Taman Sri Muda, which is uh, Taman Sri Muda, a, a disaster happened between 18 and 19 December 2021, uh, started in 18 December around 10 a.m. in the morning. And it started with a flash flood. And due to the geographical area of uh, Taman Sri Muda, it escalated to a major disaster with more than uh, 20 deaths around that specific area itself. And thousands of people evacuated, their house submerged in, um, <clears throat> in the flood itself, millions of damages. And this incident, in a way, portrayed some of the many challenges in disaster management and early warning system in Malaysia. So I would like to use this case study as uh, the basis itself. A bit about Taman Sri Muda, it's located near the Kuala Lumpur city centre here. All right. But it's around 30 kilometer to 40 kilometer north of Kuala Lumpur city centres. It's in Shah Alam uh, area, Selangor. It's an urban area, developed area uh, near to Klang River, uh, just uh, north of uh, the Taman Sri Muda area is the Klang River itself. And one thing that most people living here are aware of is the risk knowledge itself. So <clears throat> people are neglecting the fact that uh, Taman Sri Muda was flooded once about 26 years ago in 1995. So no one expected that this would happen again in 2021. So uh, in a way, we take things for granted in a way. There's no specific risk assessment made around the area and the possible major impact which may happen. And considering 26 years of urbanizations happened uh, the, in the surrounding area, industrial park, commercial area, housing, and more. So 
the risk knowledge are not uh, the risk analysis are not being made and there are lack of risk knowledge uh, of the area itself and uh, if you look here this is the elevation level of Taman Sri Muda area and if you look carefully the average elevation is around four meter and uh, the maximum elevation is eight meter the minimum elevation of tam in Taman Sri Muda area is two meter here two meter so Taman Sri Muda area is like uh, a ravine itself it's like a bowl of soup even the river itself the Klang river itself is higher than the, uh, the lowest level of Taman Sri Muda so this has caused uh, when the flood happened back uh, in 2031 causing major impact to Taman Sri Muda so the risk knowledge itself is one is one of the challenges that we are not looking into the details so like I said earlier, Taman Sri Muda area is like a bowl, of, a bowl of soup itself. And after we know the risk knowledge, we understand the risk knowledge of the area itself, we look at the monitoring and warning services. How about the monitoring and early warning system of Taman Sri Muda area? This the second element of community-based early warning system. And for your information, there are one flood gorge and two sirens around the area. All right, the uh, one flood, uh, gosh, the, the uh, water department in Malaysia stated that the warning siren at Taman Sri Muda started around uh, 2 a.m. or uh, sorry, uh, 10 30 on the 18th uh, itself, and uh, the danger siren started at 12 30. Uh, the second siren, which is located at Taman Sri Muda tree, this area, the warning uh, siren started in 2 a.m. And the danger siren started uh, at 11 a.m. So for the sirens, uh, the warning siren at both station already started earlier. But what are the issues actually? What are the issues here that are causing such devastating impact towards Taman Sri Muda area? So going to another slide. In Malaysia, uh, the MAP Malaysia, the Meteorological Department Malaysia, send warning from time to time uh, of the possible uh, heavy rains that happened in Malaysia. If we look before uh, the incident itself, on the 15th of December, there's an alert by Meteorological Department, but mostly in the usual heavy rain area, at the usual flood area, which is in the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia and normally some area in Pahang area. And then uh, there's another... Uh, alert comes from Map Malaysia, which is on the 18th of December. On 18th of December, 1 a.m., uh, the Selangor area, uh, which is uh, where Taman Sri Muda is located, is already on the warning level, but uh, orange level is in Pahang area for heavy rains in Pahang area. But at this time, uh, Taman Sri Muda area, some area in Taman Sri Muda have started uh, the water level started to raise. <clears throat> and uh, on the same day, 18th of December, 12th uh, afternoon, in the afternoon, uh, the same thing, there's a warning from Met Malaysia stating that there will be a heavy rain, but mostly it will happen uh, in uh, Pahang area and some area in Kelantan area, but not in Selangor area itself. Selangor area is still yellow, a little level only. But suddenly, two hours after that, just two hours after that, uh, from yellow alert, suddenly it changed to danger alert of major heavy rain, which can impact uh, the area massively. Within two hours, Malaysia come up with a danger alert, uh, stating that there are uh, heavy rain coming our way uh, in the Selangor area. But the question now is, what is the intensity and the probability of flood? The, question, uh, the, the answer is, unfortunately, there's no specific analysis or study being made by local authority at that time. That's one of the answers. And later after that, uh, on the 18th, where the flood started to happen, uh, the area, especially the Taman Sri Muda area uh, in Selangor State, Selangor area is uh, considered as threat area, danger area, and it uh, goes till 19th of December, 1.40 a.m., still uh, most area 
most area in Selangor and Pahang area is red area. <coughs> and uh, did this happen previously? Uh, does the same notification uh, happen in past years? The answer is yes. Back in 2020, we uh, also have a warning alert around Selangor area, but there's no major flood happened. And considering the area in Selangor, Selangor is one of the states that uh, received heavy rain uh, throughout the year back in 2018-2019 but none of this equate to a uh, flood or flash flood or major flood that happened uh, like what happened in December 2021 in Taman Sri Muda. So the question now people are asking what went wrong? What went wrong here? What are we missing here? Well in my point of view is the dissemination and the communication part all community members should receive warnings at the same time. So we have monitoring, we have response, but from the warning provided by Met Malaysia, do we know that uh, we need to evacuate, we need, uh, people need to evacuate, the re responding agencies need to respond. So what we are missing here is the analysis part. Uh, the analysis part from Met Malaysia, the analysis part from the water department, uh, if there's no risk or low risk from the metro, uh, from the monitoring given, then yes, we keep monitoring. But if there a medium risk or high risk, then the lead responding agency started need to take actions with the community to respond to the emergency uh, situations. So that's the gist of early warning system. One is we want to have an ample time to respond to the emergencies because early warning system is part of the preparedness and response process of disaster management itself. And some people stated that Met Malaysia should have done better uh, in warning, in giving, uh, in informing people that there will be flood. But unfortunately, uh, uh, they don't understand that Met Malaysia is only providing the signs on the weather itself. After that, the respecting agencies or local authorities or companies and even the individuals need to take step from the warning given by Met Malaysia to response uh, to make appropriate response. But I'm still, uh, the Met Malaysia data given did not state the intensity of uh, the re sub intensity of uh, the 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 uh, the the, uh, the ring uh, is at the end of the day. So next we look at the response capability. What is the response capability uh, for Malaysia itself? And response capability came from education and preparedness program. Response when we talk about early warning system, when we talk about response, it does not just from the government agency. It also comes from the community because uh, maybe the lead emergency responder at site is also, the fire station is also flooded, the uh, police station is also flooded, their family members is also there affected by the flood. So now the assistant needs to come from outside of Taman Sri Muda area. And uh, the current uh, lead responding agency on site is one of the victims of the flood itself. So, <clears throat> what we sorry, when we talk about Malaysia, like uh, Yana stated just now, and <clears throat> Dr. Haliza stated just now, Malaysia have policy on disaster management first developed in 1997 but later the uh updated in 2012 version but before this is under the malaysian national security council but unfortunately in 2014 and 2015 due to the major nationwide flood which happened throughout uh malaysia every state are affected uh by that in 2014 and 2015 uh national disaster management agency was introduced in 2016 and they adopted the mnsc 20. but until uh, uh, the National Disaster Management Agency, the scope and responsibility is still a bit raw. What we see 
uh, during the response, people are, uh, are blaming, some people are blaming the lead responding agencies. But in my point of view, uh, the lead responding agencies in terms of tactical, they are doing their best. Even on the night of the disaster, when disaster happened, the lead responding agencies, the armies, uh, the NGOs are assisting the uh, community at that time. What we see in NACMA, the National Disaster Management Agency, is they still concentrated on the tactical response. But actually, NACMA is a federal agency and they should do the strategizing and coordinating response from all the multi-agency on site. This is a challenge uh, at the federal level itself. So that's why during uh, some of my interviews with the media and everything, I, I tell them it's not the... Uh, it's, uh, the impact is not because the lead responding agency lead to respond or anything, but the understanding of the strategic management of the emergency itself. Where is the area that most impacted? Where are the area that need help the most? And uh, when we talk about MNC Directive 20, due to the Malaysia system is a federalized system, not might have the authority to mobilize resources, uh, responding agencies, manpower, uh, information from other states itself, but it uh, in the December 2021 flood, the response by NATMA, unfortunately, uh, you, uh, everyone here can uh, look at this in the, uh, the media or some of the uh, reports in Malaysia, it came a bit late, three days, four days after that. So in summary, all right, in summary, Oh yeah, I still, uh, I'm at the end of my slide, actually. In summary, I would like to base on the correspondent interview that I have with the media. One is early warning system will not be effective without community involvement. So it will only waste the money to develop a system if the community don't know what to do uh, or uh, are not communicated about the system itself. Secondly, the warning system needs to be robust and able to disseminate info effectively. Maybe we should implement Internet of Things or we need to model the possible impact at least hours or even days before it happened. So community and agency can start responding before the impact itself, not during the impact. So what happened uh, during the December 2021 flood is some of the casualties, some of the people that uh, died, our condolences towards the victim, uh, they are found in their car. They are trapped in the car. Uh, traffic jam, uh, due to the traffic jam uh, around 8 p.m. and suddenly the flood came in, they are trapped in their car, they cannot get out. Uh, most of the, uh, some of the people died in their vehicle itself. That's unfortunate. And number three, is we need to play proactive roles in sustainability, urban development, concentrate on the prevention part, disaster risk reduction, the Sendai framework itself, and not just the response. Yes, my area or this disaster management, but it, uh, preparing for disaster is to reduce the impact of the disaster. We need to focus on preventing it from happening. Flash flood should not be happening at all. So that's one thing for sure. And finally, community-based emergency management or community-based early warning system is a must, but not only by the responding agency. It must be developed together with the community. All right, the community need to know. Uh, the community need to know what to do when they hear the alarm. All right, Com need to be communicated to the community on a frequent basis so that the moment people hear the alarm, they know the severity and what needs to be done at the end of the day. With that, thank you very much. Back to you, Elena. Thank you so much, Dr. Karimizal, uh, for your presentation and talk about mobility response um, that should be aimed to help the victims of flooding before and after the disaster. Uh, with that, it's a pleasure to pass the floor to Mrs. Farah Farida Baptist to give us an insight from the NGO's perspective in flood relief and whatnot. So I welcome uh, Mrs. Farah Farida. To us, the flood affected, it, it not really happened uh, one day or two days. It will drag to maybe one or two weeks 
after. So this is a picture of me in Segamat, one of the district in Johor, uh, really bad affected. So we have to, uh, we have to send um, our aid and assistant by the boat because uh, the water raise level at that time um, that time is on the 2nd of january 3rd sorry 3rd of january the water level rise until chest level at mostly at the mostly at the villagers house okay this is where we started our mission in slango uh, on the 21st of december right before uh, before christmas uh, we started later <clears throat> but we actually um, help the places that uh, maybe people or uh, the malaysian less concerned during that time we know that sri moda have a lot of people helping them including all the ngos as well and the agency so we focus um, on um, the another area in Selengo, uh, which is in Sungai Lui in Hulu Langat and Banting area. So in summary, we have a total of about 50 volunteers involved during this two weeks mission. In Selengo, we already have about 4,000 families. In Pahang later, we also help um, the families or the flood victim um focusing in the Malog itself um, one of the district also uh, really bad affected uh it comes about eight thousand families and last uh we end our mission in segamat in our state we have about twelve thousand families for about one month so we have we are based in johor baru it's very south just nearby singapore segamat and johor baru is about two and a half hours journey so you can imagine uh, it's like Johor Baru to Malacca or Negeri Sembilan so it's quite long journey to Segama so we in fact uh, arrange our program and our humanitarian mission there a total of 13 mission <clears throat> so uh, we thank you uh, our soul kind thank you our Malaysian that truly help all the flood victim and i know that they are truly concerned in helping the flood victim so this is where uh, we help one masjid one mosque in tamalo and three houses that um, really affected so as you can see um, in malaysia the when the flood happened i think most of the flood victim um, maybe can consider if the water the water enter to their house um, maybe if we can see a clear water but in johor i think in, Pah in pahang and slango the mud really uh, give challenges to us during the cleaning because we, as we can see here the mud level is up to our ankle so if let's say we wait until maybe two or three days after it will be more uh, we it will be more tiring to do the cleaning part so that's why do when we know uh, we also based on map malaysia if let's say we know the weather will be okay or maybe better than yesterday we will quickly um, try to clean the uh, public area public area first then on because it when we clean the public area other people also can uh, can enter and can use the the route and then later only we can focus to um, clean um, our the families nearby so here is in Johor Johor Bahru we mixed together pictures in 2020 and 2021 but this the first up level is the picture where in Segamat in 2022 the first week of January as you can see the water level is up to the roof so and the authority need to evacuate them to a safer place so there is 
truly a challenging for us and also to the flood victim. So we in, in Segamat itself, we can only help um, to clean their house two weeks after Ileana. Because uh, during that time, the weather is still uh, heavy rain and the water rise level from Sungai Mua to Sungai Segamat is quite high. So um, in this case, uh, we also need to take care of our Sukarelawan safety, our volunteer safety together with um, the flood team. Because um, in Johor, uh, we have two separate um, two separate the uh, victim where they agreed to stay in the in the evacuation center but on the other part one side also they will um try to when they can let's say they can stay in their house in fact if the water level can up to until their ankle or even their chest uh, their ways because they would more concern on the safety of the entire house um, items because they worried they worried um, what will happen to all their items so um, hence when we do our humanitarian mission we would focus on the people on the people or the flood victim at their house because we, we would know the people in evacuation center will be take care by the state government or even the welfare agencies so from our observation from our observation and from our interview um, with the flood victim we can see two sides of people uh, where one side they are ready for the flood the other side they are not ready not to say they are not ready maybe they don't expect the worst thing would happen to them maybe from the previous last year it can happen only at chest level uh, or even at the waist level but now the due to maybe the uh, climate change and the global warming warming situation right now so they can't as they they uh, they don't expect uh, the worst can happen. So this is where um, from we gather from our interview and what we gather from the, uh, the people who have like better uh, on their flood risk management. So if you can see here, they they built uh, we can say a lot thing whereby they an area at the roof level so they can um, keep their safe document or anything available. The other pictures um, uh, uh, at the bottom, there is a floating house, a temporary, a small one floating house where they keep their their valuable, um, like example for TV or in fact <laughs> one on this uh, in this case they keep their washing machine because. When uh, they told me, they told me personally, they just bought the washing machine, so they want to keep the washing machine. So um, we identify they actually prepared for the flood. It just that maybe um, some of some of other people um, they they would expect maybe it's not worse. Uh, it won't get any worse uh, the situation. So another part, this is, um, I take a picture from uh, in Kelantan, whereby um, the father actually, okay, this one, um, the father actually uh, was an architect, um, architect, and they built one flat barrier for brother at the end of the road. So you can see the water will just die, just straight uh, without enter there. Yes, that side. Yes, on that side. This is where in Pasir Putih. Okay, the other one um, on this uh, right side, we can see this initiative from these local people. They build up a wall protection um, at, uh, I think this one is um, above anchor level. So this is where uh, we may we can suggest to the people or to the community if um, 
there are places uh, who always who quite frequent uh, affected by the flood, they can use or they can implement uh, some of the tips. Because I would agree with Dr. Nizal, the uh, great if this is a very good we can engage and we uh, we team up with communities definitely would one uh, they would want to have a uh, uh, cost so i'm sure they would agree all of this initiative and these tips so on the other one um whereby uh, we um i encounter uh one area in putra uh, in cyberjaya they wrap uh the couple wrap the <coughs> the car with a plastic cover and truly after that uh it, it is truly waterproof so this is can be one of the initiative uh that the community whether in uh Selangor or sabah can use one of these mechanisms as we can see from the from the report impact um the flood, uh, flood in malaysia 2021 uh, prepared by our department of data dosm the the vehicle losses is about one uh, two billion to two billion total uh, losses damage is about six billion um Elena. So in for vehicle only um, is about one to two billion. And the rule of thumb is um, we need to engage, we need to in, we need to get together with the community to clean the river and not to litter their river because um, we also encounter um, there's um, garbage and waste uh, being waste uh, being at being at the uh, at the riverside so we we hardly we can hardly see this um very low awareness that um to the community uh, which we need to increase uh, this awareness uh, between the community also the other one is the flat uh, flat barrier or wall protection which um this one uh, maybe um the community itself can take their initiative to build a wall <coughs> to be a wall uh, to build this wall <coughs> okay next iliana okay what we do actually uh what we do and what does our part um, help the people that we truly uh, get ourselves wet and dirty because we know um, the flood in Johor will be packaged together with the mud. Um, as you can see, uh, we need to use a water jet to facilitate the cleaning process. So in this particular case, we choose a family with um, old folks um, have no men that maybe can help them to clean their house or even a single mother. So we will uh, parity this um, group first. Then only we can, we will only help other other flood victim. Oh, see, this is um, um, most of our contribution and our humanitarian mission where we help them to uh, during uh, in the evacuation center or even in, at their house so uh, we focus on food packs and hygiene kits and and together with sleeping kit sleeping kit uh, in this case uh, normally we focus on two which is the blankets or um, a mattress a simple mattress Okay. This also um uh, do this is this is our uh, our contribution during the first two days in the evacuation center, whereby while waiting for the agency to prepare to prepare the food packs, so most of the NGOs and also individuals will also play their roles to help 
the flood victim. Next. Okay, this is where in Kuang, uh, few districts that we help, um, where we encounter a single mother uh, with, the dis uh, uh, with, the dis with the disability to clean their house, to clean her house actually. So what we can see here, we actually help her to cement her house um, to because uh, two three days after, we, um, according to Map Malaysia, there will be another second wave. So that's why we help her to increase the cement level at her house. Okay. So this is before and after. What um what had we done? Um, one of the flood victims in Kota Tinggi. Kota Tinggi also is uh, one of the district uh, last, last two years had a very worse uh, flood happen. But Alhamdulillah, this, this year uh, it only affected few places only. Okay. So this is in Mersing. We have this particular school. It has uh, two levels, uh, two level of the school. Whereby the first level uh, flooded with water for about five days. So hence. Um, all the school items like table, chairs, uh, in fact, the printers and uh, teachers' belongings um, have, have damaged. And we had contributed uh, from our friends and from the public to donate to this particular school. This is uh, one of the Orang Asli school. Okay. Okay, what would I would what I would like to share is this uh, particular um, community in um, Towowo Mersing, whereby the water rise level at this time, can you see the arrow here, is about 14 feet. Um, these villages have about 20 families and um, you can imagine they have to um, be safe at a 20 plus, uh, 20 times 20 safe house floating area. So uh, we, after, I, after we discussed with my team, so we agreed to build a floating house which is three times better and bigger. So here, okay, next, this is the particular floating house. So this is where we encourage the people, the community to be resilient and sustainability because they would know, uh, they know actually to be safe during the flood. Uh, for these particular villages, they priority their life first rather than all the items in their house. Uh, if we, if I can compare this one to the other other um, other places, so they focus on to be safe first. So hence we agreed to build this floating house. So it takes about three months three months of uh, duration, we joined together, we collab with um, the community itself. They helped to build this. So we only bought them the raw materials. So last year, um, we when we visited them in November, uh, it, it definitely um, uh, put us a smile whereby um, 20, the 60 times 20 flooded uh, floating house is ready and they use it this year. In fact, for sustainability, this floating house they use as a, um, a tourist attraction actually. So this is where we can help the, the people to, ha to have extra income. Okay, um, this is uh, our, uh, we appear in the media. That, that is actually the previous floating house. It's a 20 by 20 size. So you can see it had tremendous help and have extra spaces for the families to be safe uh, in the floating house. So uh, I think uh, that, uh, that ends my, my presentation. I also um, uh, would agree that the early warning system uh, 
um, is um, parallel important um, with the involvement of the body. I would like to, um, to suggest to make use of our best social media because most of the people have their own social media, have their own WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook. I think we can utilize fully utilize on the social media. So that, um, the community and the people around are fully aware of anything unjustified or anything un uh, undramatical happen again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Farafarida. Uh, I apologize to the attendees for the slight technical problem. Um, we had like a long discussion from the early world uh, systems in Malaysia to government and community working together to uh, for fraud mitigation. And now we can see for ourselves what the communities were doing during the flood uh, disaster. Um, in the interest of time, we're gonna go straight ahead to the Q&A session. So we actually have a question for Haliza Abdurrahman. Um, the time severe impacts can be seen, oh, sorry. I wondered a bit about the rationale behind the CCTV coverage. Is there a risk that real-time CCTV information may actually reduce protective action prior to the flood impacts actually occurring? So, yeah. Okay, thank you for the question. Actually, uh, the question can be answered by Dr. Miza. <laughs> the 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 apa? How efficient of the early warning system, uh, such as uh, CCTV, to uh, prepare or to make sure that uh, public can uh, early prepare uh, to face the um, disaster, eh, the the flood. Actually, um, CCTV, eh, as we know, is very efficient because maybe um. Uh, the 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 system can um uh, record eh? record and also can um saw eh? the, the the life situation in the field uh, for example in the river eh? which uh, when the the um level of the water is um unusual eh? I mean um uh, um so uh maybe somebody is um have a task eh, to, mon to monitor the CCTV. Then when uh, they saw eh, the unusual of the uh, water level, they can pass the information eh, to the um related agencies such as the JPS, the Met Malaysia, so they can uh, uh, warning the public eh, to prepare so uh, the impact can be minimized. This is one of the function of the CCTV. Maybe Dr. Miza can add some information on that. Uh, thank you for, so much, <coughs> Dr. Hariza. Well, uh, in a way, actually, I'm one of the person who are not agreeing much with the decision of the CCTV. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but actually, yeah, the 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 reason behind it is is a barrier method, which uh, just in case if uh, like uh, the sorry, I lost my word. The flood detection uh the flood monitoring system that they install is only at certain area so they want to install cctv at other area just to look at the increasing of water level and they want to uh what the government want to do is they want to uh introduce big data and iot into the system itself where it can monitor uh the flood level even before maybe the water are reaching uh the water are increasing uh, on uh, at the upstream, and they can monitor it before the water uh, going down uh, the downstream itself. So that's uh, one part of the usage of the CCTV itself. Secondly, is as uh, as a fail safe if if uh, the current warning, current alarm, and current sirens are not functioning as it should be. That's the second part, but this is where uh, I came in uh, into the session and I voiced out that rather than installing the CCTV itself, we can install other type of sensors because CCTV uh, take, uh, will, will impose a lot of costs, millions of ringgit, comparing to a simple uh, sensor connected to the, means, uh, to the main flat warning system itself. So, 
Yep, there's a pro and con in it. Uh, if we are looking at a longer run CCTV with IoT, yes, uh, it will be a better uh, solutions. But if we are looking at short term implementation, uh, installing sensors at the upstream uh, or flood flow, uh, flood prone area will be better. But still, still, uh, my point is we need to improve not on monitoring the flood itself. We need to improve on monitoring the possibility of flood from the meteorological data itself. So that's much more important comparing to monitoring the river itself at the end of the day. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Um, I have a question for Mrs. Farah Farida. So we saw from the December disaster how the communities mobilized themselves and work together. Should there be a centralized app that lets the communities talk to each other so they can request for assistance. Um, so what do you think, Ms. Farah? Well, Ms. Farah, you're on mute. Yes. Oh, I think there's Hello. more technical difficulties. Oh, yes. We, we have a, a very good cooperation. Okay. We have a very good cooperation. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, Miss Farah. Um, we can't hear you. Um, I'll make a list of the Q and A of the Q and A's that we have today, and we'll forward that to you, and so we can have your response. And I'll forward that to our attendees. But in the interest of time, uh, let me move on to another question from the audience. Um, one of the questions from the audience is, okay. I'm interested to hear about the sirens being used well in advance. Do the people know what to do when they hear the siren and where to find information about the action to take? So. Thank you very much. I think uh, I will be the one who should be answering that. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Madeline, for the questions. Um, <clears throat> All right, like, like I said earlier, earlier, like I presented earlier, one of the challenges that we have is hearing a siren but not knowing what to do. That's what the community are faced with. The community hear the sirens, the community hear the alarm, and then the siren, the first siren, and then the second siren, but the community don't know what to do. There's no procedure in place. There's no guideline in place. The previous procedure and guidelines only, only concentrated towards the roles and responsibility of the lead responding agency, like the fire rescue department or the police or the uh, civil defense. But uh, for the community itself, it is not properly communicated to the community on what needs to be done when they are hearing this kind of sirens. Yes, there are uh, uh, areas that they can evacuate to. There are schools that uh, they can use for evacuations, but the schools normally are opened up by the lead responding agency. But still, still, if the community are not hear the sirens, but they uh, don't know what to do, or maybe just the siren is from uh, uh, an ambulance, or maybe they think the siren is from uh, uh, firefighters or anything, they don't know what does the siren mean. Because the early installation of the sirens, the, the communication of the system only made, been made to the uh, people that originated there. And then we are looking at people coming in after that 10 years, uh, along five years, 10 years, people, new people are coming in into the area. No people are living in the area. And the older people might have uh, moved out from the area. And now they see the siren, they hear the siren, 
they don't know what to do with it. So that yes, that is one of the challenges. But the siren should be one of the response, early response process that being made. And if you look at Indonesia uh, after the uh, tsunami in Aceh back in I can't remember the year. Uh, they are using the sirens, and one of the case study back in 2016 when they uh, uh, the siren be uh, being made at midnight, 12 midnight, uh, due to earthquake in Japan. Uh, within one hour, the whole villages already ran to the evacuation center because the villagers already know what to do uh, when they hear the siren, but. Unfortunately, in Malaysia, uh, for Taman Sri Buddha area, especially, it's still at early phase. We have the silence, but people don't know what to do about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for, thank you to all of the attendees and the presenters today. It's what, it was a very informative um, talk. Um, with that, I'm gonna let the, I'm gonna let Karina do our summative comments. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much uh, for such a wonderful uh, session today. Um, it was absolutely uh, brilliant. Um, and I think that we've had um, some wonderful insights. So thank you very much to our, our speakers. I just wanted to give a couple of um, comments um, in terms of uh, to summarize some of the points that have been made. Um, so uh, Dr. Hellies said, talked very much about the value of early warning systems and the importance of these being made and how these fit in with international uh, regulations and requirements which is so so vital but also the need to improve uh, communication um, but she's also presented the challenges involved in the different types of warnings that we're seeing. So whether that's um, atmospheric flooding or flash flooding. And of course, that's so challenging with flash flooding because it's such an imminent hazard. It's very, very challenging to, to manage. Um, but of course, there is no such thing as natural disasters. But of course, it is challenging when we have such small timescales. Um, and clearly, um, there's a lot of role that technology can play. But of course, Dr. Um, Mizal then went on to talk about actually uh, we need to not forget the role of the community and the community needs to be responding to, to warnings, that the community needs to be preparing, that the community needs to be involved in the warning systems themselves. And, and absolutely, there were a number of really great uh, points that were made there on how we can make warnings uh, more effective by integrating the community, um, how we can work with scientists to model uh, potential flooding activity to prepare and make the community and agencies aware of what a flood might look like and how it might impact that community. Um, and of course, um, um, to um, work in terms of prevention and increasing um, resilience and sustainability in the community. And of course, that picks on, on many of the, the great comments that Ms. Farah um, gave us about the, the amazing work that her NGO has been doing in terms of responding to um, various crises of flooding, but also the, the work that could be done in terms of preparedness for the next flooding events, such as uh, cleaning out the rivers, um, preparing communities for flooding so that they can make themselves resilient, protecting their valuables um, and, and basically building that community resilience and knowledge. Um, and so it's very interesting that it's really important that when we deal with warnings that we also engage with humanitarian um, groups as well who are able to give insights as to what needs to feed into to those warning systems. So a, a really fascinating session there and some really good um, uh, outcomes. Again, I think just in summary, I think, you know, Malaysia are clearly working really hard to improve their warning systems and, you know, scientifically and technologically um, it's doing very well. But it's just that integration um, that's coming out and that's something that everybody faces challenges in doing in terms of communicating and reaching with the end users so uh, we look forward to seeing what Malaysia does next in terms of how to enhance their warning systems and so once again I'd like to thank our speakers uh, very much for joining us today and taking time to present uh, and be part of the Q&A. Thank you also to our host Iliana who's been magnificent she is our work placement student here at the, the Warning Research Centre and she's done a marvellous job today so thank you very much Iliana and um, we want to thank the rest of the team for the event um, just to remind you this event is recorded and will be available 
available on our YouTube channel for you to watch alongside a number of our other uh, webinars that we have as part of the Warning Research Centre. So please do take a look and uh, we hope to see you at future events. We have a, a full calendar, as I mentioned at the beginning, so please do take a look and we hope to see you again. So thanks very much for joining us today and we hope to see you again at our future events. We've got one next Wednesday, so check out our, our, our webinar um, information on our, 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 our website, uh, which is looking at warnings in film and documentary. So we hope to see you uh, next Wednesday. Thank you very much again, everyone, for joining us and we wish you a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Liana. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. All. Thank Have you so nice much. Day. Thank you. You too.